This video is a ministry of the First Baptist Church, Pampa, Texas. We are located at 203 Northwest Street in downtown Pampa. Join us for worship this Sunday or visit us on our website at firstpampa.org. Now enjoy the rest of the broadcast. With me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, glad you're here this morning. I, I, I went over to, I knew Richard knew that he was supposed to do the welcome earlier in the service, but as a, somewhat of an Oklahoma football player in his past, uh, I didn't know if he'd have the courage to come up before you, but he did, so congratulations Richard, we're proud of you for facing uh, such a tough time today. <laughs> hey listen, you, you people... Y'all never pass an opportunity to make fun of me when my team gets beat, so i just got to jump in where I can. John chapter 4. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about what it means to grow healthy as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ. It's, it's not something that happens automatically. It's something in which we have to be very intentional. We have to be on purpose about trying to grow in our, our faith, and we've looked at four different essential elements, if you will, the first of those being grace, that grace is something that you, you come to know Jesus Christ. We receive his gift of salvation through works, not uh, through, uh, through grace by faith, not of works, not any effort on our own. We receive salvation by grace, but then that's not the stopping point because grace continues to transform our lives. As we grow in Christ, there's a, there's a, a transformation, a, somewhat of a sanctification process, if you will, that takes place where we begin to, to display these traits of Christ and we begin to be gracious in every area of our life and we come to understand what that means. Then the next week we talked about the second essential element. And by the way, these things are not necessarily stair steps that you have to do one before the other, although receiving Christ is certainly the starting point, but then the transformation of grace is an ongoing process. But uh, you come to know Christ through grace, and one thing that helps us to grow in our faith are being involved with other people, and what we've described this as are being a part of groups or growth groups, because iron sharpens iron. We help to encourage one another and to support one another and to challenge one another to grow in our faith. And never anywhere in Christianity, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the, the early church was it ever said that in Christianity you could, you could be saved and then just step back and live in isolation. That was never part of Christianity. There were some groups that twisted that and said, oh, you need to isolate yourselves and separate yourselves from people. That was never a part of New Testament Christianity. New Testament Christianity is all about living in relationship with other people. And specifically, it emphasizes the importance of living in relationship with other Christians. Because that's how we sharpen one another and we grow in a healthy way. Can you be a Christian and not be a part of a growth group? You can be a Christian and not be a part of a growth group. But you can't be a healthy growing Christian and not be a part of a fellowship of other believers. So grace groups. And then we talked about how the Lord's gifted you, how each of us in Christ have spiritual gifts in the way that God has shaped us. And, and in addition to that, given us talents and interests and things, God has gifted us to be able to use those gifts for his purposes, for the fulfillment of his calling. So part of growing healthy as a believer is to utilize, put into action the gifts that God's placed in your life. So are you with me? So far we have grace, then we have groups, and we have gifts. And last week we talked about, the, remember the sermon where I had to close the doors and keep you from running out? We talked about generous giving. Because if you're a follower of Jesus and you're going to grow healthy, then there's going to be activity in your life that you generously give to the Lord through the ministry of the local church. That's an important part of growing healthy as a believer. This morning I want to wrap up this, this series, but just to tell you this, uh, these are not necessarily things that you accomplish it and you check the box and then you go on and you don't have to worry about that anymore. It's not like, well, once upon a time, way back when, I helped in three-year-old vacation Bible school and that was all the giftedness that God had ever given me. So now I don't ever have to do that stuff again. No, that's not it. It's an ongoing thing. It's an act of obedience for us to use the gifts that God's given us in service of the church and, and all these things. So they're, they, they're kind of interchangeable and they all work together. They're interrelated. The last one that we talk about today is going. 
You see, going as a Christian, sharing our faith, going on mission for Christ, to be a growing Christian, a growing Christian, requires going. And being a growing Christian results in going. So if you're going to share your faith, it's going to help you grow in your faith. You can't grow healthy as a believer and never talk about Jesus. I don't know at what point that came about in the history of Christianity, but it was a huge mistake for people to think, oh, somebody else will take care of that. I don't have to do it. Because some of the last words that Jesus gave us were the importance of going and sharing our faith. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Stay there in John chapter 1. We'll get there in a little bit. But Matthew 28, 19 and 20, uh, passage that we call the Great Commission. Jesus said this. He said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, uh, observe, and obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always. Surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus, in some of his last most important words to us, some of his most influential and important instruction to us was that we go with the gospel. Now, how do we come out of that and say, oh, well, that's just what some people have to do? That's not instruction for all of us. That's just some people have to do. So my question is, are you going with the gospel? Are you going with the gospel, has there been activity in your life recently where you've told somebody about Jesus that, that may or may not know him? Just curious. When is the last time in your life, just, just stop and think about it. Some of you could quickly say, because you identify that's a regular part of your life telling people about Jesus. But I, I have a suspicion that that would be not the most common answer. A lot of us have a relationship with Christ. If someone comes and they just happen to ask us to pray for them or something, then yeah, we might jump in there. But when is the last time, let me take it a step further, when is the last time that you were intentional, that you were on purpose about seeking out someone who doesn't know the Lord and telling them about Jesus? They might be seated across the table from you at dinner every day. It might be someone that you interact with at work. It might be someone, you know, where you, where you shop, where you get that regular routine. It might be that person that you encounter all the time. That God has placed you in their life. Not just to be a big tipper, although that should precede you trying to tell them about Jesus. By the way, if you're the tightwad, you know, trying to figure everything to the penny and you start at 18% and then deduct for every minute your food is late, then you don't tell them about Jesus because <laughs> you're going to be a you're going to be a bad witness. So maybe that generous giving should precede this. But no, whoever it is that God's put it in your life, how can you share with them? When have you taken an opportunity to to share with them? Let me just let some of us off the hook by giving you some reasons that we don't often share the gospel. Stay there, John chapter 4, we're going to get there in just a little bit. And just so you'll know, this is kind of an introductory message today, and then we'll kick off our next message series next Sunday with the same passage of Scripture. But why aren't most people going with the gospel? Several reasons I think are significant. First, they aren't convinced of the gospel in their own lives. One reason people don't tell others about Jesus is they're not convinced of the gospel in their own lives. If they're not sure, they're saved. If you're not sure that you're saved, if you're struggling with that, if you think there's, salvation is out there but it's elusive and there's no security and confidence in your life, then you're not going to tell people about Jesus. 
So the first thing I'd like to tell you is at the conclusion of this message today, we're going to sing this song we sang uh, just a little bit ago, In Christ Alone, and you're going to have an opportunity if you've never responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our pastors will be here at the front. If you've never responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ, I encourage you to come up to one of them and say, today I want to nail it down for sure. I want to know that I know that I know that my sins are forgiven and that I'm saved. And these men would love the privilege of sharing with you about that. But if you're not sure, if you're not convinced in your own heart that you're saved, you're not going to share the gospel with other people. Because you say, well, why would you invite them into obscurity or confusion? The second part of not being convinced of the gospel, some people don't share their faith because they're not convinced of the exclusivity of the gospel. Not convinced of the exclusive nature of the gospel. So what do you mean by that? I mean the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. Now the world's not going to tell you that. The world's going to tell you there are many paths to heaven. And some people sit back and here's their attitude. Say, well, I, you know, I believe in Jesus. I, I'm a Christian. But that person over there, they'll find their own path. And whatever path they find will be fine for them. This is the path for me, but they're going to take this other path and they'll do just fine. Will they? Will they? If you think that, you're not going to tell somebody about Jesus. If you think, oh, there are many paths to heaven, why bother telling them? But if you believe and are convinced in your heart that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, then you're going to want to tell them about it. Let me give you three scripture verses to just write down these references. These might be three that you need to memorize or meditate on, especially if you're not sure about that. Because again, the world is going to tell you, you just pick a path to heaven and get on a path. Doesn't matter which path, you just pick one. But I think these, these three specific verses disprove that. The first is John chapter 14, verse 6. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Jesus said he's the only way. No one comes to the Father but by him. The second passage, second verse, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else. Let me, let me read that again to you slower. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That's pretty clear too, isn't it? See, this being settled who Jesus is and knowing he's the only, it's not confusing. He's made it quite clear in his word. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say everyone shall be saved. See that? Does it say everyone shall be saved? It says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It also does not say everyone who's been a really good person and calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Doesn't say that. It doesn't say everyone who didn't have any of those big bad sins and calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say everyone who never had a criminal record and calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Doesn't say that. Am I missing something somewhere? It says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It also does not say everyone except those who are social outcasts. Because we're about to look at a passage of Scripture in John chapter 4 of Jesus' everyday encounter with a woman who was a social outcast. In fact, that's the very reason that he encountered her, encountered her this particular afternoon. Because she was one that no one wanted anything to do with. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, 
First, uh, people don't share because they're not convinced of the gospel in their own lives. Secondly, they aren't captivated by the love of Christ. We don't share the gospel because we're not captivated, we're not controlled, we're not permeated by the love of Christ. So what do you mean? I'm, I'm loving Him all I can. I asked Colby to sing this song, Clear the Stage, and I love that bridge in there because, well, I don't know how much I love it, but it's very convicting. Anything that I love more than him is an idol. I, I, I can't remember all the other words to it, but anything I put before my God is an idol. It might be a job, it might be a relationship, it might be a savings account. It might be a football team. It might be deer hunting. Fill in the blank. Because here's the key. I'm not just picking on those four things. Every one of us have those areas in our lives, and they're different for all of us. Every one of us have areas in our lives where we're susceptible. Where we're susceptible to that thing or that person or that activity being a, a dominating, captivating focus of our hearts. And if we allow something like that, or if we allow unrepentant, ongoing sin in our lives, then we're not captivated by the love of Christ and we're not going to tell people about Jesus. The last reason that we don't tell people often and consistently about Jesus is, and I, I put on the PowerPoint, is they don't know how. And, and as I looked at that more, I, I should have written it this way. They think they don't know how. Or we think we don't know how. Like, like many of you, probably most of you, now our churches, we have a lot of folks that a lot of you did not grow up in, in a church background. That's wonderful. We're so glad you're here. Some of us did. And I was, I was in church from nine months before I was born till today. But if you grew up like I did, evangelism in our minds became a program. Evangelism was something you did on a certain night of a week. Evangelism was something you had to go through and get trained or get certified to do that and then when somebody did get certified we just look at them as they were odd they were certifiable <laughs> look at that they tell people about jesus all the time they're kind of radical aren't they well maybe that should be the norm and not the oddity I, i'm certified in evangelism explosion have led that participated in that in churches uh faith evangelism just name the program we've come up with some good programs but the problem is we have programmed evangelism and let ourselves off the hook, to be honest. We've let ourselves off the hook and said, oh, they will do it. Or somebody else will take care of that. I don't have to. Oh, it, it's not my semester. We just did that the first six weeks of the semester. Now we're on a break, so we don't have to tell people about Jesus. Well, there have been some great ideas about evangelism programs come up. When I was a youth pastor in Plano, I had a guy call one time. His name was Al. I answered the phone. The secretary said, do you have a phone? Someone wants to talk to you about an evangelism program. And I thought, well, this could be interesting. So I pick up the phone. I kid you not. And it's, it's ironic that my team got beat by Alabama last night. But he said this. He said, this is Al from Alabama. I want to tell you about our new witnessing program. Okay, love to hear about it. He said, well, what we got are these new T-shirts we designed. And if you'll buy these T-shirts from us, it has some kind of picture about Jesus or a saying on there, and you can start a whole new witnessing program at your church by buying our T-shirts. 
I didn't buy any t-shirts from Al. I've got some just like you have some. But if somehow we think putting on a Christian t-shirt is going to substitute for us actually talking about Jesus, we're confused. Well, there are a lot of good ideas. I don't know if you've ever been to a Christian bookstore and up by the checkout counter they have these little, little tins called testaments. You know what testaments are? They're breath mints. And if you open it up, they're breath mints that have a little cross on them. And then they started expanding, and then they put little fish, a little ichthus, a little Christian fish on there, you know. So I know, I just, I'm picturing in my mind what the evangelism program is with this one. Friend, your breath smells like the pit of Hades. <laughs> and if you will eat this, you'll have the aroma of heaven from here on. Listen, we don't need a new program. We need to get with the program. We don't need to come up with some new money-making venture to sell things and build our brand. We need to tell people about Jesus. So how do we do that? What do we do to, to go about these things? I think we follow the example of Jesus. Jesus. This morning, my emphasis primarily is about the importance of going, but beginning next week, we'll look at a large part of this story, and in subsequent weeks, I want to share with you about some of Jesus' everyday encounters with people that we find in the Gospel of John. Because Jesus met people along the way. He met people as he went, and, and the other thing you discover is they were all different. Not once did Jesus encounter someone just like him. Look with me in John chapter 4 this morning. I want to introduce this, this uh, wonderful story to you today. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. It says, now he had to go through Samaria. He must needs go through Samaria. And he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there. Jesus, as tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone, at that point, had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. We'll pick up with some more of this story next week, but I want you to, to think with me about just the, the first key, the initial step to going with the gospel is to look for opportunities to have intentional conversations. Look for opportunities to have intentional conversations because here's what happens. God takes the ordinary of our lives and makes it extraordinary. God takes those things that look like mundane, daily routines, that nothing significant about it, God takes the ordinary and makes it extraordinary. Notice even this. What does it say about Jesus? Jesus sat down by the well because he was tired from the journey. He was wore out. We don't know exactly how far he had walked during this particular segment leading up to this, but, but he was tired. 
I went with my son and his roommates yesterday to play a little bit out at Hidden Hills, and you know what? About one hole, and I'm tired. When you have to walk as far to find your golf ball as I did, not these three pros, but as I did, you get wore out. We don't know how far Jesus was. You know what it tells us about Jesus? He was normal. Jesus was fully man. He was human. He was subject to physical fatigue just as we are. Has there ever been a time in your life when you said, oh, I would do that, but I'm just wore out? Sure, we, we've said things like that. But has there ever been a time where we said, well, I'd visit with that person about Jesus, but, but I'm just exhausted. I want you to think about that, not, not just in the literal, literal sense, but think about it in the figurative sense. Jesus, one translation says, he was weary from the journey. Some of us don't tell others about Jesus because we're weary from the journey. We've gone through some challenges in life. We've gone through some very difficult days. And we're dry spiritually. He was dry physically. He was parched. He was thirsty. That happens to us literally, physically, but it also happens to us spiritually. Listen, if you're at that point and you say, I, I just can't share with anybody, I feel dry, then let me, let me challenge you. Then go to Jesus, the one who will provide living water for you. Because when we run dry, that tells me that we're not going back to him continually. Jesus didn't fill us up at the point of salvation where we never have to go back and spend time with him. Not true at all. In fact, Jesus spent every morning with his father in prayer. Even he knew the importance of going to the Lord in prayer. We must make that a part of our lives. First, God takes the ordinary routine of our lives and makes it extraordinary. Secondly, carve some margin into your schedule. Carve some margin into your schedule. The people in this world today, in particular in the United States of America, are busier now than ever before. Do, can you name five people that aren't busy? I can't. Everybody's busy. It, it's good to be busy. There are times I like to be busy. There are times I like to have things I know that I'm going and, and doing. But if we're so busy and life is so hectic that we don't stop to tell someone about Jesus, then life's too busy. Are you with me? That's for all of us. And, and let, me, let me add this to it. And sometimes, Baptist churches are the worst about putting so many things on people that they're too busy to turn around. I can tell you of times we've been so busy that we couldn't even, we didn't even have time to go next door and talk to so and so because we got to go back to church or we got to go do this, we got to go. That's too busy. One of the greatest tools the enemy's using that, that is, is sapping the vitality of Christians from going with the gospel is busyness, our hectic schedules. So realize that Jesus can take your ordinary and turn it into something extraordinary. Be intentional about carving some time into your schedule. And talk to people. Talk to people about the Lord. What a concept. <laughs> it's more than a t-shirt. Talk to people about Jesus. Well, preacher, if they wanted to know, they'd ask me. They know I go to church every Sunday. 
If they wanted to find a church, there's 50 of them in this town, they could sure enough look one up. That's, that's kind of how we rationalize. Say, oh, they know I'm a Christian. I've made that known. Oh, well, they're, those lost people, they are not interested. Let me share some thoughts with you about people who are unchurched. These are not mine. These are, these are proven responses to research that says these various things about people who don't know Jesus or don't have a relationship with the church home. Unchurched people, number one, are not anti-church. Number two, they wonder why their Christian neighbors and friends do not invite them to church. Unchurched people are 82% somewhat likely to attend church if invited. 70% of unchurched people believe in a real heaven and hell. Say, so, well, they wouldn't believe in this. 70% believe in a real heaven and hell. 76% of them have a high view of the Bible. Say, oh, if I quoted a scripture, they wouldn't believe it. Research says that 76% of people have a high view of the Bible. So they're going to pay attention. They're going to attend to that when you mention it. Unchurched people, they're nervous, but willing to talk about matters of faith. So don't just think that you're the one that's nervous talking about Jesus. They might be also but they're willing to talk about matters of faith. Unchurched people, number seven, would prefer to talk to a lay person more so than a minister about religious matters. They'd prefer to talk to a non-minister about religious matters. Next, very few have ever had anyone to explain to them how they can become a Christian. And that's the one that over and over when I read these kind of facts and, and research, it's just it's surprising to me because I grew up hearing. I grew up hearing about who Jesus is and the difference he could make in my life and what he had done for me. But there's so many people, even in our neighborhoods, even in Pampa, Texas, there are people that have never heard it explained to them what it means to have a relationship with Christ. Number nine... And this ought to really capture our attention. Many unchurched are far more concerned about the spiritual well-being of their children than of themselves. How important do you think children's student ministries are to our churches? It's very, very important. And parents, even parents that don't generally have anything to do with the church, that's, that's very important for them. And then lastly... Unchurched would love to develop a real, sincere relationship with a Christian. Here's the key. They want to see if what we say we have is authentic. They want to look at us and see if we're the same person Monday through Saturday that we say we are on Sunday. Authenticity is critical for them. Let me wrap up with this. There are three ways that you need to begin every day with prayer. You might need to jump ahead a couple of slides on that PowerPoint. Three ways that you can begin every day in prayer. And then we'll look more specifically at who this Samaritan woman was next week. Three simple prayers to pray every day. Number one, Lord, give me eyes to see the lost around me. Lord, give me eyes to see the lost around me. Number two, Lord, give me ears to hear where you're leading. Lord, give me ears to hear where you're leading. And number three, Lord, give me the words to say. Lord, give me the words to say. If you will begin your days with an intentional, prayerful focus about going with the gospel, the Lord will give you opportunities. Don't feel like, I don't know where to go, I don't know where to turn. He will answer these three prayers. But he's waiting your 
availability to say, Lord, I'll go. I don't know where to go. We sang a song a little while ago. Where you go, I'll go. Three prayers. Lord, give me eyes to see. Give me ears to hear. Give me words to say. Would you bow your heads with me?